Hello. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Ruth Slavid, as you can see. I'm your chair for the day, and I am delighted to be chairing this because I think, as we are all aware, this is such an important topic. We know there's so much that we need within housing. Um, we haven't got enough of it. A lot of it's not good enough and it costs a lot of money. Uh, we need to find solutions. Uh, the question we're looking at today is uh, whether MMC is going to be the solution to this. Uh, we've got a fantastic lineup of speakers. Uh, I'm not going to waste your time talking to you too much, except to say that we will be having a discussion at the end. Um, and do please on the question function, send in your question. My advice is always send them in as they occur to you um, because otherwise you can forget them. I will remind you about this as time goes on. Um, and we'd love to hear from you because that will make our discussion even more lively. Uh, now we have five speakers to hear from. Uh, you can see them all along the bottom of your screen. Um, and I am delighted to introduce the first of them, who is Mark Farmer, who is the CEO and founding director of CAST, which is a specialist construction consultancy. And he'll tell you more about what they're up to and what they're thinking about. Mark. Thank you, Ruth, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, delighted to be part of this panel and um, answering the exam question, which is the link between offsite construction or perhaps in the broader context, the concept of MMC, pre-manufacturing, lots of different terminology, but um, generally the concept of innovation and the link between that and our sort of fairly urgent need to deliver more housing in this country, but deliver more better. So, you know, that in itself is already a challenge in terms of historic trends. Whenever we've tried to increase housing supply in this country, we've tended to have real struggles in terms of the construction and home building industry's ability to deliver quantity and quality side by side. And that has always been a feature of an expanding construction industry, which when it expands, it becomes stressed. We have issues in terms of getting sufficient number of people with the right skills and competencies, doing the right things in the right way. So what usually happens is that when we have boom periods of construction activity and home building, quality suffers. And I have to say in the last economic cycle, um, certainly in the period between the global financial crisis and uh, COVID, it's quite clear that has happened in this country and it's probably been amplified um, at a, a level we haven't seen before, uh, possibly because of the role of things like social media, uh, increased consumerism, a real sense that the public is fighting back against poor quality homes. So that really is a bit of context perhaps around well what are the solutions in terms of us having to build homes in a different way and that for me is where the whole mmc debate that's where the concept of off-site um or even near-site or even on-site manufacturing comes into play because all of those are effectively encompassed in the concept of the, the broader uh, description of pre-manufacturing which is using manufacturing process to drive more quality to drive consistency of approach uh, all through using process, because the one thing our industry struggles with is to adopt a structured process to what it does. Uh, and that's no one's fault. It's just by virtue of the fact that everything we do is effectively prototyping. Every home we build is pretty much unique. Um, and that means that everyone is doing things uniquely again and again. And we repeat mistakes that links to the quality issues that we're seeing. Um, and um, that really is an inherently at the heart of a declining resiliency we see in our industry. I just want to overlay a couple of other things that I believe make the, the link to modernization and MMC even more important for our industry moving forward. If we've got any expectation of wanting to build more homes in this country, and I know there's a political debate going on as we speak in terms of the government perhaps rowing back from setting national targets, in home building, um, but then set against that, they're looking to potentially liberalise planning. So lots of sort of uh, things are changing out there in terms of the the context in which home building is potentially going to happen in the future. Um, but I'm very clear that if you take planning out of the debate, 
you have the 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 one of the key issues is going to be the production capability and capacity of the industry to deliver um, certainly anything over 200,000 homes a year which is where we sort of peaked out in this in this last cycle I think the highest level was about 220 odd thousand homes um, and the sort of the notional target was 300,000 homes we certainly have an undersupply issue in this country um, and my concern is that actually the labour intensity that we have historically applied to building homes and actually just in broader construction is no longer tenable. And we have a structural decline in the workforce in this country that is very clear. It's now backed up with evidence and data from um, the, the latest census um, from last year um, and lots of um, data points that are now showing we have an aging demographic. So we have more and more people leaving our industry. We do not, we continue to struggle to attract new young talent into our industry. So we're not replenishing. And then we have the added dimension of the historic migrant dependency of workers, certainly in London and the South East. Now, effectively, the tap has been turned off with Brexit. So lots of constraining factors on labour supply. And if we do not improve productivity, our ability to deliver more is reliant on more people just at a time when potentially our workforce is declining. And in the last cycle, just to be really, really clear on this point, for the first time since the First World War or post First World War, our country was unable to regrow its workforce out of a previous down cycle and recession to where it was and beyond at the previous peak. So we are now mirroring demographic trends that were only seen in 1919 when there was such a high level of male mortality after the First World War that the construction industry could not immediately get back up to speed. And we now have that as a set of circumstances without that big external issue sitting there as, a, as in terms of a conflict having degraded our workforce. We just have an aging workforce and not enough new people coming into it. That should be quite sobering for people. That should get people to sit up and listen and think, actually, if you want a future proof business in this sector, whether you are a house builder, whether you are actually a material supplier, a contractor, a consultant, it doesn't really matter. You're all affected by that fact that we are going to have to change to a less labor dependent model that improves productivity, is able to secure a better quality and actually moves us to a point where we can overcome some of those challenges. The other linked issue here is the, the broader societal and now political driver of ESG, climate change, decarbonisation, which is going to drive the industry towards a different place anyway. So that it just it's coincidental in some respects, but actually what it does, it doubles up on the um, perspective drivers for change that the industry is having to face into. And it's quite clear that if you innovate and you modernise and you're using pre-manufacturing, different categories of MMC, which no doubt we'll talk more about in this session, if you do that well with the right materials, with the right process and efficiencies sitting behind it, you will reduce your carbon, both embodied carbon and operational carbon. We'll build with less waste, we'll build with less embodied carbon in material, um, and we'll build higher performing homes if we put them together and manufacture them and assemble them in the right way. So there is actually a sort of a, a, a cause and effect here. So to achieve net zero and decarbonisation, then we're going to have to change to a manufacturing um, skewed approach. And this is not to say that all of a sudden everything has to become modular because there's a lot of misconceptions about what we mean by offsite manufacturing. And that is dominated by everyone thinking that means volumetric modular, which is in reality quite a small part of the overall equation. What we're seeing more and more is that the pre-manufactured value of um, developments is increasing but it's increasing incrementally. So people are just embedding more pre-manufactured content into their projects. It might be panels, it might be sub-assemblies, it might be mini pods. It doesn't have to be entire developments. But what it's doing is it's taking labor hours off site. It's reducing the labor dependency. It's enabling us to scale, to increase um, our, our production with the same, or if not less people. Um, and just sort of bringing this to a close, I think for me, one of the key things that to be clear on is that the move towards modernizing our industry is not without its um, pressure points, its difficulties, growing pains. And you would have seen lots of headlines 
in the last few weeks and months about quite well publicized failures, um, financial failures of businesses, uh, particularly off-site businesses, um, the prevalence of big startup businesses continuing to be in, in a loss-making position in the early phase of their development. Um, and I think it's really important to recognize that some of those headlines are actually planned and known and a part of the cycle of innovation. You need, need deep pockets to innovate and do that at scale. Some of them are actually just down to business models being fundamentally flawed. And you know the MMC sector is not immune to that from uh, just as traditional construction is as well. So you have to, if we're going to innovate, we have to do it well. We have to be responsible for delivering good quality products. We have to actually deliver to the promise that MMC potentially has, uh, and certainly what government and what all of my work connecting with government, particularly the housing ministry, DLUC and Homes England, it's all about the potential of what it can unlock around better quality homes, more homes, um, and contributing to, to great places. And with, that's the important thing here, it's a means to an end. Just the very last point on the, on the last bit of the exam question about better value. So the challenge there is modernization and industrialization needs scale. So we're not gonna get reducing con construction costs unless we can scale um, and scale to a level where industrialization reduces unit production costs. And we also need to decouple the benefits of production savings from land. Because if you just save money on your production, it, uh, we have a strange system in this country where ultimately it just was utilizes back to higher land value. So you're not gonna generate value for the end customer unless you're able to put MMC with reducing production costs aligned with sub-market value land. If you do that, then we can drive the value bit of the equation as well. I'll leave it there, um, because I know that others have got lots to say on this, but um, hopefully that makes some sense and uh, happy to take questions later. That does make a lot of sense. And I think one of the things that would be really interesting to talk about is when you talk about scale, um, obviously, if you are industrializing elements of a building um, rather than volumetric, I'm guessing that you've got more flexibility in your design than if you're going volumetric and saying we need to design, you know, umpteen units, which we can make all these volumetric units for. That's my take on it um but you know i you're an expert there'll be a lot more experts and i will be really interested to see our discussion later on uh we are getting questions coming in uh do please send your questions in as well uh for mark and for our subsequent speakers uh and the next one is stephen whiteman who is the mmc lead at uh, faithful and gould uh, Stephen, over to you. Good morning. Um, I think it's interesting that uh, Mark's introduction has been, been really interesting. And the, the elephant in the room, I'll just touch on that before I actually dive into a, a, a fairly, well, it's not a brief slide deck, but it covers the key points I wanted to cover. Um, I think the question we should be asking in this industry is, and, and the focus on, on construction um, offsite companies failing is an interesting one. What we should really be asking is why do so many companies fail in construction full stop? In actual fact, the failure rate of offsite companies within the construction industry is lower than the percentage of, of offsite companies within the construction industry. So in actual fact, they fail at a lower rate than traditional companies do. But one of the biggest issues we have in our industry is we have a huge level of failure and a huge level of companies that go into administration and failure. And I think that is actually an underlying problem and more of a more of a fundamental problem, perhaps, the, that, we, that we ignore at our peril sometimes and it's something we ought to be examining you know we need to create more resilience in the industry it's not acceptable that the assumption is that companies will go out of business and just re be reborn that's inefficient it's wasteful and it's um it's corrosive okay well thank you very much everybody for attending um as ruth said my name is stephen whiteman i'm the uk mmc lead for faithful and gould a multidisciplinary consultancy many of you probably know us um but those who don't we're part of atkins and snc lavalin um that's the advert over so key the question and the point that mark made which is absolutely crucial and i make no apologies for reinforcing mmc and offsite is a process not a product it's effectively a methodology it utilizes similar materials it's a methodology of delivering a building using a process driven approach in multiple locations not just in factories but also on sites 
and Mark's being a little bit modest actually because he was fundamental in some driving some of these um, changes that we're seeing in the industry and particularly in actually standardizing some of the terminology and approaches that we're using. So back in 2017, um, and I was, Mark was kind enough to invite me to be involved in this process, there was actually a task force to try and identify or, or rationalize some of the terminology that was used around the MMC and offsite space. And consequently, um, we came up with seven categories of offsite or MMC uh, approaches. They're listed here. Um, we can talk through them briefly, but the key ones realistically from the delivery perspective at this moment in time are category one, two, three, and five. So category one is volumetric 3D components. Category two is 2D large format aggregated components. That's usually panelized systems, but with other elements aggregated with them, such as windows fitted or m &E fitted into them. Category three is 2D standard structural components. So that's SIPs panels, glue line beams, precast plank. Category four, is 3D printing. It's there. It was recognized as being an, an emerging technology and one that needed to be in, but currently fairly low level in the UK at the moment. So for the purposes of my discussions, I'm going to slightly ignore it. Category five is non-structural components. That's bathroom pods, composite M&E, used widely. And then category six and seven were site-based improvements. As Mark identified, this is not just about factories. This is also about doing things better on sites to reduce labor content, to reduce movement, to reduce waste. So all of these add together to provide a, a sort of framework in which we can discuss this, these processes. And what I'm going to do is just run you through where, from a consultant, consultancy perspective, we see these fitting best within the housing sector. So where does MMC fit best in housing? The reason for this context is it's really important that we actually do things for the right reasons. This is not a philosophical debate. It's not about doing something because it's, the, it, you know, we should just do MMC. I spend quite a lot of my time actually persuading clients to do things in the right way. Unless MMC adds value, you shouldn't do it in the same way you shouldn't do anything within a process unless it adds value. So the key is to identify where the different types of MMC can add value within the process. So if we look first at category one, which we've talked about being the volumetric systems, works very well in social housing built to rent and multiple occupancy tenancies. That's because the drivers in that market sector are around speed, early opening, potentially minimizing community disturbance. Um, you usually could be working in occupied estate. Build quality is really important because the asset is usually retained and owned by the, the, the purchaser of the asset. So that the housing association or the, or the social landlord or, or whatever, or the, even the, the, the organization, the funding organization. So quality is really crucial. They're looking for cost certainty. And Mark talked about sustainability, which is interesting. The process of building using MMC is inherently more, more sustainable not because the materials are inherently more sustainable, but because the quality is better and therefore it's easier to achieve high levels of performance because the waste factors are much lower. Typically, the construction industry wastes a, a reasonable percentage of what it produces. For Somebody produced a statistic that said for every ton of building, there's up to between 10 and 100 kilos of waste produced. Offsite businesses are producing significantly less because they buy materials cut to size. They don't transport waste to the factory and then take it away again. So there's huge benefits in, in those areas. In category one, there are some restrictions associated with, with housing. It's, it's, more, it's less flexible. It's more difficult to manage some of the flexibilities perhaps required, particularly in the private sector about you know, changing completion dates. It requires a fixed program and more concrete and firm decision-making processes. There's perceived to be a cost premium. I would always challenge that. And the volume point that Mark made is an interesting one around that. We, we need volume. We're starting to see it in certain places. And procurement wise, it is more of a challenge from a procurement perspective. It doesn't fit necessarily as easily within the traditional procurement processes of construction because of the aggregation of value with the offsite process. But there is traction, it is producing some good stuff. So this is a, an image of an Ilka home. They're developing um, a lot of projects and they've got quite a good pipeline now. You're seeing people like Urban Splash. I know they failed, but the concept was still good. And they've delivered a number of good homes across the UK. 
Um, we're seeing people like Barclay developing out with some of the manufacturers, relatively small typologies around apartments. And at the very top end of the scale, the poster boys are Vision and Tide, who are building up to sort of 44, 38 stories at this kind of typology in a volumetric approach. So it is getting traction, it is delivering good projects, um, and it, it has its place. If you look at category two, um, we're seeing that BTR and social housing is still being used extensively in the aggregated panelized systems and multiple occupancy. But we're also starting to see private sale being used more extensively in, this, in these locations. This is a slightly more flexible approach. It allows less aggregation of value. It still offers the benefits around community disturbance and, and rapid weather tightness. It's much easier to benchmark costs because the aggregated values are lower you tend to have a more traditional approach to the buildups of things like finishes, fit out, those, those kind of elements. Still offering quite good benefits about reducing working height because you're reducing the need for people to be inserting windows, etc. There's still a bit of a fixed program. Um, it does still require some early decision making and there can be transport issues for large format components, but there are some significant benefits. What we're seeing in those locations is things like these. This is a development by a company called Ederoth which is actually part of it's an Atkins um, development. That's at the back of a garage site in Lambeth, very tight site, difficult to get at, panelized system worked, a volumetric system wouldn't have done. McCarthy and Stone are now using this approach extensively on their um, apartment complexes, and they're finding both program and cost benefits within their processes. At the sort of high end of the scale, a company like Crea producing a concrete panelized system. This is an 18 story apartment block in Coventry that was being built out at the rate of one floor per week, 400 square meters of floor deck per week. All of those windows, all of that aggregated external content was included in that building when it was delivered. The only thing they had to do on the outside was seal the joints. So in terms of that working at height issue, significantly reduced. And at the sort of more traditional end of the scale, the sort of timber frame product from the likes of Stuart Milne and those kind of people, highly used in Scotland, now being used more and more extensively in, in, in England and, and Wales. Category three, so this is smaller level components, more standardized component types, um, really being used across the piece in housing. It's offering a very flexible approach. It does allow some aggregation of elements you can add quite a lot of local content, which works well for some for some um, builders and some approaches. It's a very easy procurement approach and it works well within existing management processes. There are minimal program benefits. There is still a degree of weather dependency and, and waste because you're cutting standard components and quality control. You're relying more on that trade skill set on site, but it does have a good place and it's being widely used even by the, you know, by the mass house builders as well. Category five, so this is the non-structural components, you know, could be down to the level of things like the prefabricated chimney stacks, the bathroom pods. Again, it's designed to remove those complicated trades from site. It offers that improved quality control and easy procurement and those existing management processes work. The program benefits are a little bit minimal and it is governed by preceding works, but it's gathering pace and it is an opportunity in that space. So how do we engage with MMC? There are a number of problems that slow down the growth of MMC around the whole process that we currently use. There's a lack of exposure. There's a lack of impartial information. The delivery model meets procurement guidelines. There can be a lack of confidence in suppliers and systems and a lack of client side guardians to manage the process. And there's also preconceptions about MMC. You know, it's temporary buildings. It's poor quality. It's it's difficult to procure, et cetera, et cetera. It's a porter cabin, if you like. And as Mark said, that MMC is just um, volumetric, which it absolutely isn't. What is interesting is that we're seeing Reba, and I know there's a lot of architects on this call. Reba came out with the new DFMA overlay for the Reba plan of work in October 2021. And that identified a number of approaches, specifically around the MMC assessment process, to look at assessing the MMC options as early as possible at stage zero. And the graphic on the right hand side is sort of advising when you should be thinking about looking at that. I would uh, I would suggest it's really worth reading. It's a great document and it's very good. It talks as well about an open protocol, returning <coughs> opportunities for, for developing different typologies and then refining them through the later stages of the process. And the key really is around that MMC advice. And they've actually identified a role of an MMC advisor to work alongside the architect, to work alongside the delivery team 
in the same way as a BRIAM advisor advises about BRIAM, an MMC advisor can advise about MMC, what works, what doesn't, and what to, what to do. Okay, I've nearly finished. I'm just going to look at what's happening in the marketplace and what's coming up next. What we're seeing in the marketplace is a, is a growth in the industrialization of processes, shop floor data, live data terminals, and the changing of production processes as well around automation and process breakdown. And we're seeing, interestingly, the growth of third party supply chains and sub assemblies like car manufacturing. So you're seeing sub assemblies coming into assemblies. So new factories coming up to deliver sub components into larger format facilities. We're also starting to see the use of robotics and 3D printed elements and data capture and workflows and more manufacturing based materials, things like dry finishes, dry jointing and, and one or two areas like that. So there is some significant growth in this sector and some really interesting things happening in the world. Um, I'm going to close with my question that I always pose is, have we been here before? Yes, we have. And, and people often talk about you know, the failures of the prefabricated buildings of the 1940s. They were only supposed to last 10 years and a lot of them are still here. So I don't think that's actually a failure. I think that's actually a success. They did far more than they were expected to do and they delivered in real, a real value for the people who use them and they delivered against what the criteria was. It is a little bit different this time. I think we have far more robust processes. We've got better design, we've got better detailing, we've got more, um, more work going into this and more control. And we've got, I believe, a very robust it growing industry that's going to really deliver value in this space and is additive to what's currently there which is key because it needs to add volume as mark said we've got to add volume to this space my final call out to everybody is i tried modern methods once and they don't work and i've heard that so many times in my career don't blame the brick mmc offers significant benefits when used with the right projects the right designers the right suppliers and contracts but it's important to know when not to use it and what to use. And the key is early consideration. It doesn't restrict the options and it offers that opportunity to incorporate these systems and deliver the values and benefits. That's a quick run through from me. Apologies, I've run very slightly over, overrun. If you do want to get in touch with me with any direct questions, um, please go ahead. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. And I think it's really interesting uh, when we looked at those uh, prefabs and you said, well, they didn't fail, they lasted a long time. Uh, the only failure that was there was that we rather failed to replace them and provide the homes that were needed. And maybe there's an analogy there with what we're doing. Anyway, lots to think about. Do please keep sending your questions in. I think we'll have a really lively discussion at the end. And I am now going to introduce our third speaker, who is Kevin Dundas, who is MMC and Offsite Manager at Wilmot Dixon. Kevin. Thank you. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in um, to today's webinar. We're looking at does offsite construction offer a credible solution to addressing the need for more housing, improved quality and better value? And again, thanks to Stephen and Mark there for their earlier presentations. And I think Hopefully with my presentation today is just going to kind of build on that. I don't think it's going to be anything contradicted and we're probably all going to touch on the same sort of things. Um, but I'm coming at it from a slightly different angle from a main contractor. Um, so it'd be interesting, hopefully, to see uh, if, the, if the viewpoints come across any slightly different and it'd be good to have the discussions at the end. So for those that don't know me, my name is Kevin Dundas and I'm the MMC and Offsite Manager for Wilmot Dixon, who are a privately owned contract and interior fit out group funded in 1852. And I've been with the business for around 15 years in various roles from site management, buy-in, supply chain management, and now MMC. But all through my time at Wilmot Dixon, I've been involved in some degree of offsite. So Wilmot Dixon have been doing offsite construction way before I took on this role um, and even before I joined the business. But it's always been a bit sporadic and only considered sort of project by project basis. This has changed sort of this year and myself and a team of other enthusiastic people about looking about making changes and producing strategies and procedures on how we can make offsite the norm within our business. So it's great to be here today and be asked to be part of this panel. And uh, thanks for Keystone for inviting me along to be part of that. So when I read the question, my initial answer was an instant yes. Um, however, not only would that have made a very short presentation, um, it would also have been quite inaccurate. So in true sort of politician style, I'm going to give a bit of a yes, no answer to this one. Um, and I wanted to break the question down a little bit. So for me, break it into sections, um, see if I can come up with a slightly different take on it. Um, firstly, to mirror kind of Mark's comments, um, 
when you a lot of talk around MMC and a lot of talk that I have around MMC um, is a lot of it perception. So a lot of people around the subject automatically think full volumetric modular construction with total solutions being built in a factory and turned up to site on the back of a lorry fully finished. When I think about this form of offsite, I actually don't believe it does offer a credible solution for the question um, for everything. And I do believe it has its place in the industry and certainly on paper should address all the points raised in the question. However, for me, capacity continues to be an issue. And if we all switched our strategies and designs to fully modular, I think it'd actually slow the industry down. But I do agree with what Mark was saying, actually, that the more we did it, the more production would be there then actually that would be. But at the mo this moment in time, I think it could cause us a problem. Um, We've also witnessed in my business um, where this type of construction hasn't always improved quality. And it comes down to management and how we change our management style as well. Um, but obviously quality issues, when they arrive on site, it's very late in the process. So for us, it causes problems because we actually things turn up. We've then got to make changes, do things that have never been factored in. Um, leads to very long delays. And the value question, in my opinion, is certainly up for interpretation on what the customer perceives as good value. And certainly for us as a main contractor, and I can only speak as a main contractor, um, but the business model changes quite considerably when you're looking at fully volumetric. So for us, we find ourselves placing only two or three orders for a project for the groundwork or the modular, and then probably a clean at the end. So you could ask the question, why customers pay a main contractor to manage this process? And if it's bringing them value, I'm sure there is in certain areas, but it does change that value question. Um, and also, as you know, there's several companies on the market, and I think the other guys alluded to it as well, that specialise in modular housing. But today, today, I'm not sure that any have been that successful. Um, and we see in the news about the kind of losses these companies are making. And unfortunately, we do see some that cease trading. Um, and that, as a main contractor, the risks of that potentially could be swaying my decisions on that. As a main contractor, we're taking all of the risk, but actually not having much of the control. Um, but don't get me wrong, there is definitely a place in our industry for this type of construction. Um, I just think it's not always the answer. And again, much like Stephen was saying, we need to choose when it's right to do it and when it's not right to do it. But on the flip side of this, I do believe that MMC and offsite is a credible solution. And if we consider the other side to offsite and look at the assemblies, such as the sort of framing, timber frame, light gauge steel framing, things like brick slips, bathroom pods, modular MEP solutions, etc. These solutions do provide improved value and improve speed of construction. Um, of course, they only provide benefit if considered at the right time and designed in. Where we've used these types of technologies, we've had varied results. So from experience, these work well if designed in from the start. If we try and shoehorn them in, then they tend to have the opposite effect, um, which again, the guys touched on earlier as well. Early procurement is also vital to ensure offsite is a success and delivers the benefits we all accept. Um, it needs to be a more partnered approach. So bringing your offsite partner to the table earlier will be more beneficial than playing multiple supply chain partners off against each other and only focusing on cost. So I want to give you a brief overview of a project where Wilmot Dixon did use offsite effectively, and it did prove to be a credible solution for housing. The project was Perry Bar in Birmingham and was for Birmingham City Council as part of the Athletes Village for the Commonwealth Games. Wilmot Dixon had the contract to build plots eight and nine. So the project was 430 residential units with Corsa Fien and Wright as the architect. Now, originally plots eight and nine were to house the athletes. However, due to changes, it was decided these plots would now house officials. This meant an accelerated program and the units were needed several weeks um, earlier than planned. So to achieve this, Wilmot Dixon in conjunction with the architect had to redesign and reprice the project in eight weeks with a view to achieving the new handover date. With this in mind, the focus became all around offsite and speed being the key driver. Obviously, for the Commonwealth Games, there was no moving of the, the, the handover date. Um, incidentally, I think it turned out that things changed and they didn't end up using them, but that's a completely another story. Um, the project switched to using light gauge steel frame with brick slip facade and a slide on balconies. And then internally, they opted for fully assembled bathroom pods. The decision proved to be the right one. And not only did the tower cranes come down eight weeks early, we finished ahead of the new ambitious program. So in terms of speed, this form of offsite did exactly as we hoped. In addition to speed, we also noted various other benefits, including a vast reduction in people on site. So this resulted in less Wilmot Dixon personnel on site, which was a reduction in prelims, but also less people also improved health and safety risks, especially as we were building the project during a global pandemic. And that certainly helped with social distancing. 
Site logistics were improved as well with this form of construction, and the storage space needed was far less than other contractors on the other plots, mainly down to the pre-insulated panels um, and the brick slips, where we needed one pallet of slips to six pallets of bricks. So the lightweight nature of the building also resulted in smaller foundations, which in turn meant less concrete, um, which saved money, and the project also had a reduced carbon footprint. So to back up the sustainable benefits of these types of construction, and again, touches on what Mark said, the business reviewed similar sized projects to compare the waste, electricity and water consumption. So as you can see from the table, there was a huge saving in water from 125 cubic metres on plot nine to 2,510 at Finzel's Reach, which are projects are very, very similar, similar in, in value. And then looking at construction waste, when you see plot eight produced 592 cubic meters of construction waste compared to the music box, which produced 2,571. Huge difference, very similar value projects, but having that offsite approach hugely reduced those. Um, it's also worth highlighting the bottom line. The bottom line, obviously, the Homestead was a fully traditional brick and block project with no offsite used on it at all. And as you can see, it was only a nine million pound project but it used almost double the water and produced double the waste as Perry Bar plots that were over 30 million pound more. So this comparison is really helpful because it backs up not only is the offsite faster and improved quality, but it's also more sustainable as well. So whilst I'm a believer in MMC, and I think offsite is the answer, it's not without its challenges. And in concept, contrast to just answering yes to the original questions, I want to just touch quickly on where I see the issues are for us as a main contractor. I know this may be different for a developer or a self-build, but I can only speak about what I see at Wilmot Dixon. So firstly, customers' understanding of MMC and the benefits it can bring. Not only the capital cost, but also the operational cost saving. An offsite project tends to be more energy efficient and will save on energy costs, which cannot be overlooked at the moment. Also, pending on the building um, usage, faster handover can unlock profits quicker. So for example, in the private rental market or in hotels, the quicker they get these handed over, the quicker they can get tenants in, the quicker they can start collecting rent and making money. Um, but again, it comes back to what Stephen said. It's about what's right for the project, what's right for the customer at the time. Um, another one, again, we have lots of architects in the room. And again, we have obviously with Stephen and his um, sort of consultancy hat on there. Customers not engaging early enough in the MMC process. For us as a main contractor, we get so many projects coming into us at stage four. As a D&B contractor, we much prefer pick up projects a lot earlier at stage two. If we are picking them up at stage four and MMC is not being considered, when it gets to us at that point, it's just too late. And we find that whenever we try and make those changes to switch to a more offsite approach, it causes more problems than it saves benefits. So if we're not involved early looking at the MMC um, options, we need you know um, consultants like Stephen to be in there as well, looking at the MMC and actually thinking what's best for the project. And where it tends to go wrong for us, where we see is where, Everything gets designed and planned and costed all around traditional. And then we try and go, well, actually, if we swap that for that, does it give us any benefits? And ultimately, that's where we don't tend to see the benefits. It needs to be designed that way in the first place. Um, again, also touching a bit on what um, Mark talked about as well, and, and Stephen, if anything, on the industry perception of MMC and offsite. So people have had bad experiences in the past and are worried that if driving offsite, we're going down the same route as post-World War II prefab housing which as we said, stand, stood for years, but they're worried they're gonna be causing problems and giving them um, a housing stock that will need replacing again. Um, so in summary, at this stage, I don't think the industry does have all the answers. Um, however, what I believe, and again, this is why things like today are really important and the people that are around the table, but the more we collaborate with customers, architects, contractors, supply chain, consultants, everyone in the, in the process, the easier journey will be, and we're more likely to see a credible solution in the future. Um, so that's all for me. Thank you for, for, for listening, and um, we'll look forward to taking any questions later on. Thank you very much. And there's lots to think about. I thought that when you talked about um, getting involved in a commitment to MMC early in the project, um, you said that one should talk to the contractor early. And of course, uh, the role of the manufacturer also becomes different and they need to be involved in an early stage. And I think this is probably what we're going to be hearing about from our next two speakers, how things are going to change and what they can offer us. And uh, the next speaker is Scott Denham, who is 
sales director at IG Masonry Support, um, who I'm sure has lots to tell us, Scott. Yes, thank you, Ruth. Uh, good morning to everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, we're coming at uh, IG Masonry Support from this in a, a different way, in the sense that we traditionally, our core range would very much be uh, a traditional method. The masonry support would uh, be for brickwork contractors. However, um, the two sort of uh, main brands within the IG, IG Steel Lintels and IG Masonry Support, um, have been doing off-site components uh, in hybrid in conjunction with traditional for many many years uh, started with IG lintels predominantly in the the low rise market um, and uh, and then sort of spawned um, if you like IG masonry support uh, purely from uh, contractors having difficulties with traditional methods and the time and cost the uh, sort of experiences they were having to try and get some of these details on, on jobs completed um, so we, um, as a business, uh, were approached uh, prior to IG Masonry Support being established uh, with a set of drawings for a job up in, in Scotland, a bit of a history lesson here, uh, for uh, the, the detail showed a, a brick soffit, um, which was at the time uh, quite a difficult detail and very expensive detail to put into the, the buildings for the, the high-rise sector. Now, we know that high-rise sectors are particularly tight sites, um, they, a lot of labour on site, um, get sort of, if you like, in the in way of each other. Um, at times, safety can be an issue, um, but speed of programme is key with some of these high-rise buildings. So they came to us with a problem, um, and uh, the traditional methods that they were having to use to do this type of detail uh, were very costly, like I say. So. One would be a, a rods and stirrups system for a brick soffit uh, above a window head, which you have to build formwork up on, on site prior, prior to uh, doing the installation. Then you have to have a sacrificial lintel um, and then hang the bricks, uh, each in turn off the lintel themselves. You then have to thread a rod through uh, a perforated brick or even have to drill through the brick itself. Uh, and then you'd have to fill that with uh, with mortar and let it cure. So very, very time consuming process. Um, and then at the end of it, you take the formwork down. So there was considerable waste as well. Um, and that just wasn't something that the contractor really wanted to go down. Um, the other option would have been concrete and still is a, a viable uh, sort of concrete brick slip concrete method um, and more to the sort of modern methods of construction. However, it's very, very heavy. Uh, and the contractor knew that it was going to mean that it was going to be very costly and uh, time uh, sort of crane movements to get the units in and out. It also gave them less adjustability. So they, they come to us and at the time we, we looked at it and thought with our knowledge um, that we could uh, create a, a product which we thought would add benefit and could be assembled in our factories, come to site uh, and solve some of these issues for them. So we launched um, what was then at the time uh, IG Masonry Supports uh, Brick Slip Masonry Support System, which was a very quick um, sort of brick slips adhered to a, a metal carrier, uh, traditional masonry support, which achieved that detail. And it, it took off exceedingly well, um, winning many awards too back in uh, 2015 and 2016 as Innovation Product of the Year, because it drove speed on site, quality from our factories, uh, and it allowed that detail to be much more uh, uh, affordable and uh, achievable for, for the contractors in, in, in looking at that. Since that time, we've developed it further and the Keystone Group, the IG Masonry Support are part of, are very much looking at how we can blend our traditional methods uh, and products that we offer to uh, an ever-growing demand uh, to supply uh, products in an off-site off -site capacity. Uh, not volumetric uh, as such yet, um, although that is certainly on the drawing board for us as a group. We, um, we're looking more at components such as you see here, bullseye arches, uh, large arches, and the credible sort of um, benefits that some of these actually give. So the efficiency and predictability of doing products in our factories where we're accredited to 9001 
um, means that we can make sure that the quality of the product, and I think a few of the other speakers have mentioned about making sure the quality is right, we can make sure the quality is right on our products before they go to site. And we get them there in a just-in-time manner. So they're not taking up valuable space. They can be brought in on the day or day before that they're required, and then they can be installed uh, by the contractors, and then that doesn't stop their build program. Safety, there's massive benefits potentially in safety uh, and sustainability as well. Having uh, a lot of the trade, a lot of the, the cutting, et cetera, done off-site um, means that we can make sure that the safety elements are improved, but also we can reduce the waste and a reduction in labour. And we know that labour is a massive problem in certain hubs, particularly London and South East, uh, and the skill set um, that that labour has, um, unfortunately, is diminishing as well. I think the average age for a bricklayer now is uh, well into the 50s. So it's a, an area of concern that we can provide a, an option um, that may solve some of these issues. The speed of installation I've talked about, and then I've given some cost certainty as well to, to the builder um, uh, in their programme and their budgets. So some more uh, examples of uh, products that we, we supply. Uh, the one on the left particularly is a, a quite a large brick slip multi-arch system uh, that was supplied to uh, a school down in Brentwood. Um, and um, that was uh, a tricky uh, job, but you can see that would have taken a considerable amount of time doing in traditional methods uh, rather than us uh, having it uh, pre-made off-site and then brought in we also do the brick slip lintels uh, above window heads, which can get, again, just be put in like any standard lintel, but it means that soffit uh, detail, which would have been a much harder detail to do in traditional methods, is a lot quicker and it allows them to just build much quicker. Uh, brick panel systems uh, and our most recent uh, brick on soffit system, our boss system A1, which is uh, was brought out uh, with the changes to the building regulations in fire uh, so it's a fully A1 system, mechanically fixed, and allows, again, that soffit detail, and, and it bolts just to the underside of a masonry support angle. And then there's uh, further features that we can provide, more bespoke items, and we've done some sort of cladding of columns, etc., as well as off-site solutions. Just a couple of um, examples of projects that we've helped uh, deliver and what that meant for the, the contractors and the clients involved in those. This is a project in North London. Uh, it's on the North Circular. And if you know the North Circular, you can see where the fence there is on one of the pictures, how close the actual site was to the proximity of the road. Um, this is 97 uh, houses that was built here. Um, and 50% uh, of them are affordable living houses. And time uh, constraints on the programme are key. It's one of the Greater London small projects building um, framework. And they were given a small window uh, to try and deliver these um, in. And um, originally, the, uh, the arches that you can see there, 23 separate arches were designed to be done traditionally on site. But the contractor approached us uh, quite early on uh, and asked us if we could come up with a uh, an option of doing these prefab units that can be brought in just in time uh, and, and sort of built in as they continue to do the brickwork traditionally. Um, so one of them was particularly awkward because it was uh, not only uh, uh, a parabolic arch, but it was on curve as well. Um, and we were able to do that with some bespoke bricks that were brought in to achieve that uh, level of detail. Different size scale of uh, housing development here, uh, Southmere uh, phase 1B, uh, 404 homes um, within this development, uh, over nine blocks. Um, this was um, a large scheme that we did just as um, the, the building regulations changed into uh, the new fire regs document B. Um, and it meant uh, a lot of new technologies that were going on in this site. Um, traditional brickwork was the main method. However, with the, the detail of uh, components and, and sort of arches, et cetera, that was required on the job, um, off-site solutions from IG were definitely a massive benefit to the contractor and allowed them to, to hit their, their targets on programme. 
Um, we actually come within 1% of the original budget that we set out as well on this project. So the efficiencies we drove in making sure that not only the quality, but the price uh, was very consistent, was uh, really key to that being a successful project for us. So uh, yeah, nine blocks and that has uh, just been finished, I believe. I've kind of rattled through my uh, slides very quickly there. Um, so if I've missed anything, then um, I'm sure anybody who has any questions for me at the end, I'd be more than happy to answer them. But the key summary, I suppose, from IC Mason, IG Masonry Sports point of view and whether uh, offsite solutions uh, can help the, uh, the you know the housing need that we have in this this country is absolutely it can it can help with um, a lot of uh, sites in terms of the speed of construction these new techniques um, can actually help obviously they can be a cost effective solution uh, and we can make sure that the quality of the products are uh, of a good quality as well um, sustainability is very core within our business. Um, we are recently a, a carbon neutral business um, and all of our products now have got full EPDs. So we're taking that very seriously. And again, we're having look the components pre-assembled and then brought down to site. We can give that level of detail uh, also to the contractor and the client um, in this need if we're seeing more and more design design led in sustainability. Um, they can be lightweight, so we can break them down. Um, obviously, the, the picture there doesn't show a lightweight unit. It's a, a large arch that's been craned in. Uh, but we can break down our units into smaller one-man lift units wherever possible, which helps with uh, health and safety on site. And it helps on the adjustability, uh, which is the last that can be blended in with traditional methods as well. Um, but definitely some credible solutions to help the housing industry uh, deliver on the housing that they need to moving forward. So that's that's it from me. Uh, very quick slides there, um, Ruth, but thanks very much uh, uh, for the time, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I have this, I think it's a happy fantasy, uh, where you take more and more of this uh, brick construction into your factory and all those 50 something um, bricklayers who have probably had enough of standing out in the cold, but are all going to have to work until they're 100, because aren't we all going to have to work till we're 100, uh, will be finding much more congenial employment in your factory. Um, I suspect it doesn't quite work like that, but it's nice to think about. Um, we are about to go on to our last speaker. Um, and before he talks, I would remind you once more, do please send your questions in. Uh, there isn't actually a cutoff for the questions, but it's sometimes a bit more difficult to concentrate on them once we are deep into a discussion. So if there's something that is bugging you that you feel we really should raise and talk about, please, please do write it into the uh, questions tab. And we'll give you yet more to think about by moving on to our final speaker, who is also taking a manufacturing point of view. And he is Kevin Sherlock, Managing D Director at Smart Roof. Kevin. Morning, everybody. Uh, thanks, Ruth. Uh, and obviously, thanks for everybody for joining us this morning. Um, yeah, I'm going to start the presentation, obviously, from a little bit of a different angle, um, because obviously, we're a manufacturer and an installer. So, uh, you know, we're basically a subcontractor that obviously uh, makes the product as well. So. What I wanted to do this morning is obviously, yeah, well, I'm going to answer the question, does offsite construction offer a credible solution? Um, we'll look at this. Um, the business of Smart Roof, we're in a very much a small sector in the housing market on a specialist product on two and a half story living. So um, what I want to do over the, the few brief slides that we've got is to probably just run through what the problem was uh, and then how we came up with a solution. So again, very, I'll run through these very quickly. What's the problem? What was the solution? What did we find the advantages were to the smart roof system? A little bit of an overview. Um, what the service and the package we offer, and then where it's progressed now uh, into bespoke projects, and then obviously where we see the challenges moving forward with new building regulations and, and part L. So for start with the problem, um, as I just mentioned, pretty much the product that we offer and we deliver is for the two and a half story units. This really came to the forefront when um, Pallet, um, 
planning policy guidance three came out in the early 2000s you know the developers unfortunately they you know moved away from the spacious homes on greenfield sites and it was all about higher density so um there's some images there from like say the early 2000s or 2010 2011 this is how obviously a lot of the national house builders used to build these plots so very much block work you know timber timber infill steels and as you can see on two of the images on the right hand side this was quite a common problem uh, in the fact that the accidents were happening because you had unsupported block work and obviously with the winds and everything we get in this country um there is a risk at, at that point so um so we came and we looked at this like say in the probably 2006 2007 we looked at the problem and then tried to see if we could come up with a solution so um if you look at the i say the images from block work multiple trades on site mark touched at the very beginning of the presentation about the number of trades on site the, the you know the labor force we've got now is diminishing um so if you just take that example of a couple of those images there to get to a finished property and when i call, talk about roof finish you're probably talking around about 15 to 16 operatives probably over around about a three to four week process to get that roof ready for what we'd call roof tiling with the likes of what we offer then and, and others the panelized roof solution that can turn that into the same pair of plots inside four hours with three operatives so not only is it probably higher quality but we came in from a health and safety point of view that was where where this started so um so say so that was the problem um and this is the solution so everything we do is made in a factory it's not really different what you do on on site but we take into a factory and control conditions and then when our team roll up on that day you know we're there with our cranes our operatives all the products basically just in time so again up to four products can be done in a day we've actually probably beaten that now reduced to obviously weather conditions so um other than when the crane can't lift due to high winds scaffold adaptions one company are from the drawing board to completion so that gives us control and a few of the speakers have already mentioned about reducing waste so again what we do then the materials we order in we try as best as we can to basically get everything cut to length so we are reducing our waste in the factory so very limited waste on site other than packaging um, and for us it's a fully managed process for our clients and hopefully providing the cost certainty so again, I've touched a few of these on already then. Obviously, health and safety was, is key for our business. And I think that's probably like a lot of off-site business out of there, that if you control it in a factory, obviously less than operatives required on site. So again, you're reducing that risk. Cost certainty, you know, we've all seen overrun on prelims. I'm sure Kevin's had this in Wilmot Dixon where, you know, things overrun, overrun for whatever reason. So, um, so there's definitely more cost certainty there. Consistent on quality again, hopefully, like a lot of off site manufacturers controlling a factory, everybody's probably got their QA procedures in place to make sure that when that product leaves their factory, you know, it is as per exactly what is expected. And speed of construction obviously, in our world of, of the housing, you know, when housing is going well, speed is everything, you know, to turn a roof from four weeks installation to four hours, you know, is a, is a massive reduction, you know, in prelims and, and other savings. Bit of overview, an image there, the factory. We've got a 50,000 square foot factory in Derbyshire and we've invested heavily into it. So again, I think a couple of the earlier speakers talked about investment and, and unfortunately some companies have um, have gone by the wayside, unfortunately. I've personally been involved in offsite now or in, in panelized roofs for nearly 16 years. So I think Mark touched on early, sometimes you've got to put that, that loss on early on because you can't make a profit straight away. It does take time you do need the clients buy in so again i think kevin touched on the design earlier you know we're fortunate now with a lot of clients we work for their designs have now been changed so actually by going through that process it makes it a lot easier but that has taken a lot of time to to get to that point so um i say we're fortunate now obviously with the team we've got um like i said they've been involved in in roof and panelized roofs for a long time we are seeing a, a little bit of a movement now following the pandemic obviously probably like a lot of us we're all working from home now so for everybody space is key so we are actually seeing this room in that loft um you know the, the office space the little office space or whatever it's going to be so we are actually starting to see a, a slight increase in that so again i touched on it earlier the service we offer obviously we try and keep it as a complete package we're fortunate as part of the keystone group that we've actually got two of the manufacturers in terms of dormers and roof windows 
Um, so that's you know, part of our, our package as well. So again, when we roll up, we're, we're offering the complete service. Again, when we first started the journey back in probably 2007, 2008, it was very much trying to solve the problem of what we call traditional terrace units. Um, obviously, then once that's been proven to the clients and they're happy and it, it does what it says, we now progressed over the last couple of years now into probably a little bit more in the design where there's an example of a job we done in Exmouth where it's actually a curved block. To give an example, that was 18 units that took us all told around about four weeks and probably saved about 14 to 16 weeks on a build program. And from a cost point of view, it was actually confirmed by the client that it was actually probably cheaper than doing in traditional construction. So we have the benefits of the speed, benefits of quality, and we've still kept to the design that the architect wanted to on the curved block. A latter project we're just about to complete now up in Liverpool. Um, this for the housing association where it was actually a refurb job. It was the old um, Allerton Road Fire and Police Station. Um, they had problems then trying to make the roof work, a lot of steel work, a lot of time in a very tight area. So we were fortunate that we came along and obviously uh, we completed all the apartments and that work was completed just under two weeks. So again, saving in excess of 10, 10 to 12 weeks on, on their build program. So, um, so I say, as you can see now, we're moving and we're progressing from standard terrace units to a little bit more, you know, a little bit more unique in terms of apartments and, and build like that. Again, I touched on earlier, obviously now we've got the Partel and the change in regulations coming in in 2025. So we're already working with the clients about how do we offer a solution uh, for that? Obviously the fabric first approach. So, you know, are we looking at wider cavities? Are we looking at deeper insulation? So I say we're working with architects and clients alike to, you know, to try and find that solution and, and to meet those needs. We touched on earlier about sustainability. That's obviously a key drive now. So everything we're doing in the factory, we're always looking at the range of materials we can use. And if there's ways that we can reduce that waste or reduce our transport costs, you know, these are things that we're, we're looking to in conjunction with the clients as well. Uh, and that's just an example, final photo, again, an apartment scheme we did for the client. This was one where the architect we were involved with very, very early. It was a very um, complicated steel design. So we managed to remove a lot of the steels um, so that made it work in terms of, you know, the foundation costs, speed of build, that apartment scheme was completed in two days. So, um, so very much for us as a business, it is about the speed, uh, health and safety I've touched on is, is key for us. Um, but again, we are probably obviously Steve touched on it. We probably sit in, I think it is three, um, in terms of MMC, the panelized product. Um, so I, you know, if you look at the world we're in, in terms of the major house builders, I think volumetric probably still is a little bit stretched too far for them, you know, sales rates. And obviously as who knows what's going to happen now, as we move into this economic, I don't know we use the crisis, but we're going into economic challenges, should I say. Um, but I think there is a, there is a route um, or there is a market for a panelized solution that can kind of is a midway. So uh, I think we're quite fortunate now if I look at the journey we've been on since 2006 to where we are now, um i think pretty much across the country there's pretty much all the major house builders are now using some form of panelized roof on their on their two and a half story developments and hopefully that will progress into other type you know other types of units so um whether that be like say flat roofs or or non-room in the roofs maybe cassetted systems so um so hopefully that can kind of gives you a brief overview of what we are i'll say as a product and as a business that's fantastic Oh, am I here? Can you hear me? I've disappeared. Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you sorry, roof. sorry, my little thing had disappeared. Um, apologies. Uh, that was really interesting. And actually, I'm going to put a question first to uh, to Kevin Sherlock and to Scott, um, because I was really interested in the fact that you said, um, Kevin, that on I think one of the projects you showed us towards the end how you work with the architect really early on. And we heard from Kevin Dundas earlier um, about the contractor wanting to be involved in the decision making early on. And I'm just interested uh, to know how both you and Scott feel about when you get involved and how, how early you can get involved and how vital that is. So uh, Kevin Sherlock, I'll come to you Okay, first. I'll kick off then. Um... I think probably the reason in the early days, and I think the guys touched on it earlier, 
everybody assumes that offsite, some form of offsite construction is, be, is going to be cost more expensive. It's cost yeah. straight away. And I think we've gone past that in the last few years where actually if you get involved with the client early enough or the architect and run through it and go through the costs and explain what is needed and what is not is needed with an offsite product, actually they're quite surprised. That's before you even talk about prelims. So just looking at the materials and, and labor alone. Um, I think for us or whatever, like I say, it has been a challenge, but I think, like I say, if you look at that apartment scheme, they had a challenge with the steel. They didn't think we were doing it. We were almost given that challenge to see whether we could come up with something. Obviously, when you're involved with the design earlier on, you're looking at all the areas, aren't you? So you're involved with the engineers, you're looking at the foundations, you're looking at the roof structure, and we found a solution. And in the end, it was a tick, tick, tick for us, tick for the client, tick for the architect. So um, let's say, I think if you do engage earlier, it, it generally does work. That's fantastic. But I guess my question was, how often can you engage early? How how much willingness is there to engage early? More, I, I think now more. more and more, you know, MMC offsite, it's, you know, with the, the helps of likes of Mark and others, you know, it is, it's a, it's a widely talked about, you know, subject these days. So I think now, if you go back 10 years ago, I mentioned the word MMC, there'd be a lot of nervousness and, oh, crikey, it's just a prefab house. Whereas now you mention it, the, the clients, clients and architects will engage 100%. And is that your experience, Scott, as well? Um, I certainly with architects, I think uh, particularly they're looking at new ways of uh, helping deliver housing. And uh, certainly in our sector, uh, we've had a number of projects which, uh, you know, had very uh, bespoke designs and uh, quite restricted timelines and build programs. Um, so they were looking at, you know, early engagement with people like ourselves to try and come up with solutions which were viable, uh, both in sort of cost but also uh, in terms of time constraints and uh, and these modern methods of construction really, I think, are being more embraced by uh, specifiers. Um, we, we, we have challenge sometimes with contractors and I know uh, Kevin and us will, might not like to hear this, but some contractors are, are less willing to, to engage with us earlier. Um, and there are obviously some reasons for that on occasions. Um, but, you know, some the, the projects that we get involved with um that go the best certainly are uh, where that engagement's been early Ruth well Kevin's probably delighted to hear that other contractors aren't as forward thinking as he is um we, we've got a question it's a bit more of a comment than a question but I just really like it uh from Bob Eden who says MMC conjures a fear of a lack of individuality at the outset sameness is probably more likely in getting it off the ground Compare this with mass car manufacture. Initially, Henry Ford said you can have any color you like as long as it's black. Through And that goes through to just how many new mini types does the world need? And I suppose the two questions that really come out of that is, number one, is there a feeling, which I'm sure you guys don't share, that um, MMC are limiting our possibilities in design? But the second one is actually, do we need to move to more standardization? Because like he says, you know, how many new mini types does the world uh, need? I'm going to put that question to Mark. Um, yeah, so, so I get asked this a lot in terms of the perceived tension between modernizing how we build and then architectural variety and flexibility. And um, my view is that the two um issues are not mutually exclusive you can absolutely embrace the concept of higher pre-manufactured value and i'll make no apologies for again coming back to that term because it's quite important in the context of what i mean by mmc applications uh, and creating great looking buildings um and you know obviously we also need to remember that increasingly and quite rightly the debate is not just about the buildings it's about the place and the community you put them in. So there's a bigger picture here, albeit it's probably not the subject of this debate. But I'm very clear that the concept, the categorization of MMC that that, that Steve very um, helpfully went through and I was involved with with the government um, four or five years ago um, gives you that menu of options as to how you can go about uh, embracing MMC in a way that actually still enables you to design in a fairly customized way. So a lot of the opportunities 
for standardization or what I would call invisible standardization. So actually they're part of the structure or they're part of the internal fit out. They don't actually affect the external aesthetic or dressing of a home or, or an apartment block or a building of any kind actually. Um, and they become you know, part of the chassis, if you like, or the fit out establishment um, that then can be dressed with individuality. Saying that and going back to the second part of your statement, I think there is an opportunity as well for celebrating standardization architecturally as well. So, and, and if you look back over history of architecture, there's some very well uh, established periods when standardization is not shied away from it. It was part of a vernacular that got established. And, you know, that is a potential for what we do now. We, we've got to do it well. And, you know, what we don't want to be doing is creating legacy of things that get knocked over in 50 years time. We want things to last and stand the test of time. And that's, that's the test, I suppose, for some of the more productized full volumetric options that are coming forward, where it probably does push you towards more standardized uh, aesthetic and typology um, but a lot of this discussion today in particular from from Scott and Kevin around what primary category three five and six MMC are effectively hybrid solutions that get embedded in a mix of, of very d design versatile solutions and that's where we're seeing most of the the growth in the MMC market at the moment it's actually hybrid combinations just the percentage split between what's on site and off site is just shifting and it's shifting very subtly but it's not preventing architects doing their job and i think you know that that sense of embracing mmc uh, uh, is all i also see it not just from designers architects and engineers i see it actually um from tier ones as well so i know the comments just made that sometimes contractors stand in the way but for me i'm seeing the penny dropping in the tier one market that actually peak labor intensity is no longer achievable on some sites so they're being driven towards moving those solutions off site and are actually active proponents of um, the sort of products that Kevin and Scott talked talked about in terms of you know just what are the labor saving methodologies that are going to reduce peak labor on site and make the job of integration of all of these things easier. Stephen, um, I think uh, you yeah, are think working you're working very early on uh, with the clients and the architects, mm -hmm. aren't you? And um presumably you're working with people who have at least thought about uh modern methods of construction because if they hadn't thought about it they wouldn't have come to you but i'm guessing you're having to allay quite a lot of their fears i think it's one of those things that's historically been a, been a challenge it's going to look like a load of boxes stacked up on top of each other you know it's going to look like a load of porter cabins i think mark's yeah. point is absolutely key it's about invisible standardization and it's about visible customization. Does anybody really care about the, the elements that can't be seen? Um, you, what you're talking about is a substitutory approach where you can basically substitute component for component and interchangeability. One of the areas that I think is going to be increasingly interesting over the coming years is the approach of platforms and the Construction Innovation Hub and their platform rulebook, a product platform rulebook. The idea that you can you can effectively interchange components to build up an assembly of processes. Ultimately, that's all a brick is. A brick is a component that you just build up in lots of different ways and you, you yeah. use it in different methods. The, the challenge with this is that the components tend to be a little bit larger, which is why there is this belief that because it's a bigger component, I can do less with it. You just have to work within the constraints. Um, so it is doable. There are some incredibly um, innovative and visually arresting buildings out there that were built using MMC. And Scott showed, you know, those arches. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there's a similar building in, in London at King's Cross, which was built, um, was actually built by another company, but they did a similar thing. They precast all the arches and all the structures and they glued the bricks into the precast before they delivered the units to site. There's no, I mean, in actual fact, in that case, there's an architectural detail that couldn't be built in brick. Traditionally, it could only be built by using some form of constructed, some some sort of manufactured process. And I would suggest Scott's arches, particularly the composite arch, Scott, that was both, you know, both an arch and also a curve, was probably easier to manufacture in a factory than it would have been to do on site, particularly as Mark says, with, you know, do we have that one unique bricklayer who could actually build that that composite arch structure? There's possibly only half a dozen of them in the UK, and finding them would have been hard. So I think it's it's a it's a bit of a it's it's not a fallacy that's not fair but it is just about understanding the components and understanding what can be done um but absolutely it's that that just coming back to the other point about early engagement um 
early engagement doesn't restrict the options either. Early engagement is about making sure that the, the opportunity is open to utilize an MMC system. But it's it's a lot more difficult to pick up Kevin's Kevin Dundas's point if it gets to stage four and then somebody says, oh, we could do with saving some time on program here. Can we implement an offsite approach? The chances are no, because you didn't think about it at stage naught or stage one or stage two. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do it. Good good MMC and offsite design is just actually good design. It's good load paths. It's good load design. It's good assembly processing. It's good manufacturing and efficient use of materials. It's just good design. That's what it is. So there is no reason why we shouldn't be doing that. And let's hope that in 10 years time, we're not even talking about MMC because uh, it'll be part of everything. Um, I, there are other concerns. Um, we've got a question in here um, saying all offsite construction methods are limited by the maximum size of components that can be transported by road. Uh, this is one of the key issues and a major constraint. What are your thoughts? Now, I mean, I noted that I think it was in um, Steve's presentation, but forgive me if it was someone else, that you sort of started talking about, um, for example, volumetric being particularly suitable for social housing. And I was thinking, oh, yeah, that's because they don't want necessarily big spaces in there. And while I know social housing often has better spaces than... Uh, some housing for sale i was thinking well um actually if you wanted something really big and generous you wouldn't get it but are there are, i'm going to ask this and put an auxiliary in i mean are there constraints beyond volumetric in scale because of uh transport sizes and i think the other thing that strikes me is do you sometimes have to actually build additional structure in into whatever you're providing in order for it to have the strength to be resist being lifted by crane on several points which is you know which is not actually needed when it's in position uh yeah. i'm going to ask kevin this i think me why not you okay fair enough um i, I can't think Sorry, you, that, kevin yes <laughs> there's two of us yeah just confuse me um i think it's like everything with every project you have to take it on its individuality. You have to kind of look at the project by project basis, much like Stephen was saying earlier. You have to consider everything from logistics and it just comes down to good design and it comes down to where the project is. So yes, if you're building in central London and you can barely swing a cat on the site, bringing in full massive modules is going to be a challenge and that is a constraint. But when you look at other things, you look at some of the sort of like sub assemblies, you are less limited. And I think it's a case of judging every single project on its merit and actually doing, as Stephen said, just good design, what's right for the project and designing around what is right. Um, so that's the first bit on logistics. I think it's definitely, yes, there's constraints, but I think it's the same on any project. If you take off-site, not off-site, there's always constraints and every project's different. And I think it's utilizing the best solutions for that project to get the best outcomes, whatever they may be, be it faster, cheaper, better quality, whatever it may be, sustainability. It's, judging those at the very start. And the second point on, um, do we have to have additional structures and things to support these? Again, it comes down to the individuality. So when you look at things like volumetric and depending on how tall the building's going, yes, we've got to be a certain amount of concrete is going to be in there to support and things have got to be tied back and the structures there is, you know, needs considering. But then on the flip side of that, there's also savings when you come to structures. So when you look at sort of using like more lightweight, if you're looking at light gauge steel framing, you look at brick slip panel systems, these things all become lighter. So therefore you need less structures. The, your foundations can get smaller. So therefore you're looking at less, you know, less dig, less waste going away. You're looking at less concrete. The lighter everything gets, you know, if you're using things like panels, you can do away with scaffolding and use things like mask climbers. And so there's all, but again, it has to be considered on every single project needs to be the same. But you can't get away from the fact that certain things can't be delivered in certain areas and lorries are only certain sizes because the UK roads are only certain sizes and that's, yeah. that's going to change. Um, okay, I'm going to cut. Thank you very much. I'm going to come back to Mark, I think, um, because some one of our questioners is concerned that there were already le issues with lead times on factory products. If more items move to offsite fabrication, are there enough factories to supply the products? And I'm guessing, Mark, that while you've been talking about 
big scale issue you've also been looking at how it actually works and that you'll have a view on this yeah it's a good question i think it's a fair question and challenge in terms of um you know planning scheduling again touching on what we just spoke about supply chain logistics you have to think about leading and available capacity in a different way and it, it does need a different approach around how you plan your projects and i think steve mentioned early on the um dfma overlay to the rib plan of work which is a, is a really important control document for project management of jobs and understanding decision making and the sequence of decision making needs to be done in a different order and you do need to pull out those items that are likely to be on longer leading and that's just the, the essence of manufacturing so you know leading times just they just alter between traditional construction and uh, off-site. So in traditional construction, you'll have leading issues with bricks, with lifts, with steel. Um, all, you have, all you're doing is transferring that to a different range of products, which are more pre-manufactured and more consolidated. Um, I, I think the issue about uh, capacity, are there enough factories? Um, my view is yes, there are. And actually part of the issue is utilizing, getting up to full utilization of factories that already exist, the good, the good factories. So that's not all factories. And, you know, again, I, I would put a challenge that some of the available capacity technically and from a qualitative perspective is not where it should be. So actually part of this is promoting the good companies doing great work, that creating high quality products. And actually some of them do not necessarily have full utilization on their factories. So, you know, we need to move towards using more effective use of the available capacity but then doing that in a more structured way particularly around giving advance warning of when orders are required because that, that enables the flow in the factories to be continuous uh, and not be stop start and that's part of the problem is this staccato nature of our industry you know we always want things last minute.com and that doesn't align well with manufacturing where you need much more um, forward visibility of orders and when you, if you can do that because you plan your project differently, you've brought the design forward in the process, you've integrated direct discussions with the supply chain, it's all perfectly feasible and doable. And, you know, I, I see it on our projects all the time. So, you know, I wouldn't, I, I don't think it's something that can be overplayed, um, but it, it, it does need good management of the project. Uh, I've got a question here about digital twins. Uh, someone's saying, I noticed no reference to digital twin within MNC, which surely will be fundamental. Uh, who'd like to tackle that? I think the um, digital twins are interesting. It's an interesting question. The level of BIM and digital take up within the offsite industry tends to be greater than in some other areas because you have to break the building down into components and you have mm -hmm. to break it into elements and do a level of design detail that's required to actually build it in a factory so for kevin's team because he's using machine components he has to build a digital model of the of the of the element that he's manufacturing to perhaps a greater degree than might be the case to a joiner just building a timber frame partition on site now what that generally tends to lead to is a higher level of digital information that's not necessarily being fully incorporated at this moment in time. Everybody's learning about digital twins, but I think the, the ability to utilize that level of data sets within a manufacturing process, procurement of materials, QR coding, even RFID tagging is probably going to help drive the adoption, adoption of digital twins and perhaps help the likes of Kevin Dundas's team to actually build digital models and digital approaches um, because you have to do it. You can't run a factory process by just giving a, somebody a, a, a drawing and saying, build that petition for me or build that roof cassette for me <laughs> yeah. or build that element. You have to actually break it down into component sets because you're buying in those components machined up and pre-built. Yes, yeah, so the, then the, the message is to pass that information on for the future. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, somebody, not surprisingly, is worrying about warranties uh, and saying that they've had um, issues uh, with uh, building control about, for example, the use of brick slips uh, and what control and issue of details are provided for approval. I'm guessing that's a question for Kevin Dundas. Yeah, I could probably touch on that, especially on the brick slips. We've actually done a lot of work on that at the moment. And again, I think it comes down to um, a little bit what Mark said earlier about actually is not, not all off-site manufacturers and solutions are equal. So you do have to make sure actually you are partnering with the right companies 
and actually things move on over the years and it's making sure that the companies you're partnering with have actually moved on as well and kept up with current regulations and um, improvements in quality so at Wilmot Dixon we will only use we use Brickslip so fairly extensively but we will only use Brickslip companies that are mechanically fixed we won't use anything that uses adhesive um, and we will only partner with companies that have got a BBA certification for their product so there's control measures in place and generally when you've got those control measures you don't have the problems with building control but it's just using any company or using products that aren't necessarily backed up with a certification um, that can generally cause you the problems because it's, it's interesting as well especially when you say oh we're not going to glue the brick slips on um, one of the things that occurred to me with some of these approaches is that now you know we've talked about uh, waste we've talked about embodied carbon to an extent but there is now this concern isn't there that we should have this circular design and that we should be able to disassemble at the end of construction um, and as soon as I hear about things like glues I think Ooh. I'm going to ask Stephen um, how much this is a concern of the people who you are advising and whether you think that MMC helps or hinders this approach? Um, it is a concern. It's a relatively new part of the question, but it is it is a concern. There was supposed to be a new um, Euronorm coming out in about 2017, 2018, but obviously we decided that we weren't going to play with Euronorms anymore after or the, or the CE, CE mark stuff after 2016. Um, that was designed for deconstruction, and it was around looking at the circular economy and the deconstruction process. It is something that we are finding is a question, and as you say, the, the idea that you bring in a set of components and then pour some soup in them and glue them all together into a conglomerate is, I mean, it's one of the challenges for insulated concrete formwork, for example. Um, you've got a combination of polystyrene and steel and concrete that becomes a, a, a soup. Um, so, yes, it is a concern. Um, I think it is, again, still early days, along with a lot of the sustainability questions about circular economy and what actually could you reuse, you know. The volumetric building industry, particularly the, the the higher fleets, would tell you they've been doing that for 75, 80 years. They recycle buildings on a regular basis. I think it's a question of understanding what what variability is required and where is that variability um, to be exercised. Are you going to change a house from a house to something else or could you potentially need flexibility around changing the internal componentry or changing the internal partitions? It's likely to be a house. I think yes. it's probably the case. A, a building that is designed for a multiple occupancy estate, such as a, a hotel or a student accommodation facility, may change its use to an office. Yeah. Um, but it's a question of how you do it. Now, looking at offsite componentry, particularly fit out, things like internal partition fit out, using ME componentry like bathroom pods, effectively means that opens up an opportunity to deconstruct um, and to basically refresh and renew. So there are there are some interesting aspects to the the opportunities there for offsite. Still very early days, I think, at the moment, Ruth. But it's a it's an interesting aspect of it. I'm going to circle back a little bit, um, but because uh, I'm going to come back to Scott, who I think had something to say about one of our uh, earlier questions. I think was this on warranty, Scott? Yes, thanks, Ruth. Um, I did have um, an opinion on this, and I, I sort of echo what Kevin mentioned about uh, picking the right uh, products with the right um, a credibility in terms of the certification and the process that they've gone through on their products and I know that this is always a very high profile but we were very conscious uh, when we developed our brick slip systems that we needed to to get buy-in from warranty providers LABC, NHPC, that the like so we invited them up to our offices and we went through what they were expecting to see in terms of testing so that we could make sure that we covered every step and every box that they wished us to do. We did that not only to, to please them, to make sure that the product would be accepted, but also to make sure that we were happy that we were doing everything we could to make sure it's the most robust product it can be. Further than that, we went then and did our BBAs uh, and uh, third party testing, but within we also uh, on top of that, went to a third uh, pers uh, party consultant in Arab and asked them to give us what more over and above a BBA um, do they think that we, we should do as well. So we uh, 
we sort of went above and beyond, if you like, an accreditation. And it's completely um, relevant and a good question because uh, there are unfortunately horror stories out there with systems that do fail. So uh, it's, a, it's a good question. OK, I think we're probably going to need to draw this to a close now. Um, I know that at least one of our speakers has to be off straight away. Um, I can think of hundreds more things we could discuss. Um, I'd love to talk about the uh, role of modern methods in uh, upgrading our existing housing stock, for instance. But I think that's probably a huge question that we'd need to um, discuss at great length. So I am going to wind this up. I just like to thank all our speakers very much uh, for bringing so much knowledge and uh, interest to this. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody who's attended um, and uh, particularly the people who sent in questions. And I think really um, that's it. Uh, look forward to seeing you again uh, at another event. Uh, thank you very much and goodbye.